Sometimes you see a wrestler and feel like he's just made to be a Vince McMahon guy. That was certainly the case with Ethan Carter given his physique, in-ring skill, and ability to cut a great promo. It was baffling then when WWE didn't even give him a chance to prove himself. Thankfully though, EC3 has managed to make a name for himself outside of the WWE, and even went as far as to win the world title in Impact Wrestling. Yes, from his time spent in the original incarnation of NXT, to his journey to the top in TNA, all the way to his return to the Stanford promotion and beyond, EC3 has had a hell of a career already, and at only 38, the best may be yet to come for him. So, how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into his entire career journey so far in Top 1% The EC3 Story. Michael Hutter was born on March 18, 1983 in Willoughby, Ontario, where as a youngster, he would fast become a fan of pro wrestling. And this eventually led to him starting training in the craft after leaving school and then begin to work around the local Ohio indie circuit, most notably with Pro Wrestling Ohio, where he would wrestle future NXT star Johnny Gargano at one point. All of this, of course, helped him to quickly build a name for himself, so much so that come April of 2003, Michael would get a chance to work a couple of tryout matches with WWE when he made some appearances on Heat, losing to Rodney Mack, Viscera, and Charlie Haas. After that, he would make a cameo appearance on Raw when in August of that same year, he would play the role of a police officer being brought in to arrest DX. But despite seeing a future in the rookie after this, WWE didn't feel like he was main roster ready yet, and so they passed on him for the time being, with the future one percenter from there going over to Ohio Valley Wrestling in March of 2007 instead, where he would further develop his skills further in preparation for an eventual second chance. And at that point, OVW had, up until recently, been the official developmental brand for WWE. So, with many working there still in good with the top brass over in Stamford, a good showing there would surely help Michael's case with this. That's why he made sure to work his ass off then in the months that followed, as he had a number of impressive matches there, honing his career further each week as he shared the ring with other future stars like Nick Nemeth, an MVP. And eventually, Vince McMahon would take notice of the work he was doing and the improvements he had made, as come February 9, 2009, the Ohio boy would get a second chance with WWE when he was signed up to a developmental contract and sent over to their, at the time, current finishing school, Florida Championship Wrestling. There, Michael would change his name to Derek Bateman as he immediately tried to make an impression on this new brand. And while there were some teething problems at first, come March of 2010, he would have found his groove as he started putting on impressive performances against the likes of Joe Hennig and the Rotunda Brothers, all of whom would later go on to greater fame as Curtis Axel, Bo Dallas, and Bray Wyatt, respectively. Not long after that, and Bateman would form a tag team with Leo Kruger as both men went on to challenge for the FCW Florida tag team titles that summer. Unfortunately, however, they would not be able to win these belts, but the future one percenter would find success with a different partner when, just a few weeks later, he began teaming with Johnny Curtis, the future Fandango, and they went on to win the tag team titles in August of that same year. And with bosses impressed with his progress, come December 2010, Bateman would be selected to be a contestant on Season 4 of NXT. Of course, this wasn't NXT as it existed up until recently, where it would serve as more of a super indie and featured some of the best wrestling in the world. No, this was the original game show format of the show that pitted some of the best prospects WWE had to offer in a series of challenges such as obstacle courses and promo battles. And to help him along in this contest, the rookie was assigned an already established star in the form of Daniel Bryan to be his mentor, with the American Dragon imparting much of his years of knowledge in him over the following weeks as Derek put on an impressive showing, even making it as far as the final three before getting eliminated. After that, he would make a couple more cameo appearances on WWE TV, but wouldn't fully return until June of 2011, when he became part of Season 5 of NXT this time showing more villainous traits as he started a feud with Titus O'Neil and picked up a new girlfriend slash valet in the form of Maxine. Of course, this would eventually lead to a number of months of ups and downs for the couple as they had to deal with other suitors in the form of Johnny Curtis and later Caitlyn. And in the end, realizing that his heelish ways were not the path he wanted to take anymore, the Ohio native would dump Maxine as he instead began aligning himself with Caitlyn and the two became a babyface power couple on the show. 
Still, relationship drama aside, there was still a competition going on, and it was every man and woman for themselves at that point. So Derek kept his focus on this as he picked up wins against the likes of JTG and Joe Hennig. In the end though, none of it was enough to make him the winner come the end, and so, after this, he would lick his wounds and return to FCW, which was, at this point, just about to be rebranded into the more commonly known version of NXT. And while well, he might have originally hoped that this would lead to another opportunity to make it to the main roster, Bateman's time on this new NXT would ultimately be short-lived as, come May of 2013, he would be released from his contract, with WWE evidently still not seeing enough potential in him at that point in time. Moving on then, the future TNA champion would return to the indie circuit, where he once again started performing under his real name as he began making appearances for the likes of Absolute Intense Wrestling and Florida Underground Wrestling. And given the impressive performances he was putting on here, it wasn't long before someone else took note of his talents, with this ending up being Dixie Carter, president of TNA Wrestling, who would bring him in that August for a tryout as she set about developing a new high-profile character for him. Of course, that character would end up being Ethan Carter III, the rich nephew of Dixie who would use nepotism to get ahead at all costs, a great heel gimmick that quickly saw him get over with fans as he started racking up wins against a number of jobbers during his initial weeks on the roster. But jobbers weren't going to be enough to satiate him for long, and so come November, EC3 started picking up wins against name talent like Sharkboy and Christopher Daniels too. Not long after that, and he would win a Feast or Fired match on the December 12th edition of Impact, with the briefcase he selected awarding him a future shot at the TNA World Tag Team titles. Before that match would come though, Carter would find himself getting into a high-profile feud with Sting, with him even picking up pinfalls over the icon on December 26th and then again on January 2nd. After that, he would align himself with Magnus after the two kayfabe injured Kurt Angle, with the duo from there going on to cash in the one percenters tag team title shot against Gunner and James Storm on the February 13th, 2014 episode of Impact. But while they would end up losing this, EC3 would bounce back when, upon Angle's return to action later that month, he would find himself in a singles program with the Olympic hero, this leading to a match being set for March 9th's Lockdown. Unfortunately, however, before that match could get in the ring, a legitimate injury would cause Kurt to be pulled from the show, with his replacement, Bobby Lashley, ending up taking him on instead. But that didn't mean the beef was over, and so, after EC3 and his by then chief of staff, Rockstar Spud, had gone through a brief feud with the Willow incarnation of Jeff Hardy in the intervening time, Kurt Angle would return to demand his one-on-one -on -one match with the heel, with this eventually taking place on May 8th of that year and ending with Carter getting another huge win. And so now, riding a career high, the Carter nephew next segued into a program with Bully Ray that would see both him and Spud attempt to defend Dixie from Ray's attempts to put her through a table in the months that followed. In the end though, despite EC3 picking up some wins over his opponent during that summer, it would be Bully Ray who would come out on top after he finally achieved his goal, with this eventually leading to tension developing between the one percenter and Rockstar Spud, as both men had failed to stop this from happening. This tension went so far, in fact, that come October 8th of that year, Spud would get fired from his role as Chief of Staff, with EC3 from there debuting a new bodyguard in the form of Tyrus, someone who would subsequently help him to defeat his former staff member in a hair versus hair match at the conclusion of their feud on the March 15th, 2015 episode of Impact. Following this, Carter would next set his sights on becoming the TNA World Champion, as he would face off against Mr. Anderson in a number one contendership match on May 29th. And after winning that bout, he would begin preparing for his biggest match to date, one that would see him go up against a man he'd already beaten in the past, the, by then, TNA Champion, Kurt Angle. Maybe it was this added confidence that came with knowing he could pin the Olympic hero then that helped him on the night of their eventual showdown on June 25th, because it was on this episode of Impact that EC3 would finally reach his full potential as he beat him all over again, this time raising the title above his head afterwards as he called himself world champion for the first time in his career. After that, the new champ went on a string of successful title defenses against an impressive list of challengers, such as PJ Black, Drew Galloway, and Matt Hardy, with the latter victory even seeing him obtain the services of Matt's brother Jeff for a time as per a pre-match stipulation. 
and even when he did lose the belt, he would do so without ever being pinned as it came during a triple threat match, this protecting the rising star in the process after he'd held on to it for a full 101 days by then. But still, this didn't mean he was done with being champion quite yet, as he would spend the rest of the year after that attempting to regain the strap, with him ultimately being successful in this after he won the TNA World Title Series, beating Bobby Lashley, Mr. Anderson, and Davey Richards en route to taking home the belt for the second time. Sadly though, this run would end up being a short one as, just three days later, he would drop it once more, this time to Jeff Hardy, as the now former two-time champion tried to regroup by getting involved in a number of different feuds in TNA while also making further appearances on the indie circuit, most notable for Evolve Wrestling where he would once again face Johnny Gargano. But despite these brief excursions, it would be Impact that would remain EC3's main focus as, come March of 2016, he would start a beef with Mike Bennett, this seeing the former champion actually lose by pinfall for the first time while with the company at April 26th's sacrifice. From there then, desperate to get a match to redeem himself, he went through a gauntlet of bouts so as to obtain his rematch, this seeing him take on Rockstar Spud in a Six Sides of Steel match, Tyrus in a Last Man Standing match, and then Matt Hardy in a one-on-one -on -one match, winning all three before finally getting a second shot at Bennett at June 2016's Slammiversary. And on that night, finally, the boy from Ohio would finally get his revenge as he from there rocketed back up the card again, moving straight into a main event feud with Drew Galloway that saw them face off on a number of occasions in the months that followed the most notable amongst these being their unsanctioned brawl at July 12th's Destination X and a number one contendership bout just a few weeks later. And in the end, it would be Carter who would win the latter match, this setting him up to once again challenge for the TNA World Heavyweight Championship, then being held by Bobby Lashley at October 2nd's Bound for Glory. With this in mind then, the one percenter spent the intervening weeks preparing so that when the time came, he would be at his best. Unfortunately though, on this occasion his best wouldn't be good enough, as when the time for the match came, it would be Lashley who would come out victorious, continuing his own dominating run at the top. In an attempt to rebound then, EC3 started feuding with Eli Drake heading into the winter, this eventually culminating in a unique title shot versus voice match, in which, if Carter lost, he would forego a shot at the TNA title, and if Drake lost, he would not be given a live mic again for the rest of the year. Thankfully then, the kayfabe nephew of Dixie Carter would win this bout, and from there, would get yet another shot at the top prize in the company on the December 8th episode of Impact, a shot that, once again, he wouldn't be able to take advantage of, because both he and the by then champion Eddie Edwards would end up going to a no contest that night, with the belt staying on the champ as a result. Still, given the inconclusive nature of the ending, nothing had really been settled, so it was only natural then that a rematch would be set on January 5th of 2017, this time with an added third participant in the form of Lashley. But even with a champion's disadvantage at play, EC3 still couldn't recapture his beloved world title on that night, and this would only serve to frustrate him endlessly in the coming weeks as he began to spiral further, losing more prominent matches to the likes of Alberto El Patron soon after this. Desperately in need of something to revitalize himself then, the one percenter turned heel after attacking James Storm on the April 20th episode of Impact, from there starting a feud with him that would see Carter lay 30 lashes across the back of the cowboy with a leather belt, all while he berated the new management of TNA at that point for not giving him enough opportunities. Following that, he would also develop a beef with Magnus, this ending in a triple threat match being booked between all men involved, where the winner would become the number one contender to the newly rechristened Impact World Heavyweight Championship, the belt that, up until recently, served as the top title for Jeff Jarrett's Global Force Wrestling promotion. And after winning that match, you would think that now, with a fresh character alignment and a newly added mean streak to his repertoire, it was finally time for EC3 to regain his spot at the top of the mountain. Sadly though, he was once again thwarted when he failed to defeat Alberto El Patron during their title match at July 2nd Slammiversary, this leaving the challenger dejected as he became unsure what else he had to do to get back to his championship winning ways. As it turned out, the answer to that question was to go after a different title, namely the Impact Grand Championship, a new belt that had been introduced into the promotion by Smashing Pumpkins frontman Billy Corgan and which would be contested in matches far more similar to amateur wrestling or boxing in their style, with a series of rounds, a point system, and limited rope breaks being heavily enforced throughout. 
quickly after entering this division then, EC3 would find success once more, with this eventually seeing him get to challenge Moose for the title on August 3rd of 2017, and even win it in the end after a split decision from the ringside judges went in his favor. After that, he defended this newly won gold against opponents such as Hijo del Fantasma and Fala Ba, putting on great matches with each in the process, all this before ultimately losing it to Matt Seidel in January of 2018. Still, by then, his confidence had risen so much that he didn't stay sad for long, as quickly after his defeat, the one percenter would move on to a feud with Johnny Impact, and then, from there, Tyrus too. Unfortunately though, it would be during the latter program that he would win a Feaster Fired match, with the briefcase he took home that night ultimately holding a pink slip inside it, this resulting in him being released from his TNA contract as a consequence. Of course, the behind-the-scenes reason for this was that EC3 had handed in his notice to leave TNA after getting a chance to once again sign with WWE, with the former Grand Champion hoping that now, with years of experience and success under his belt, he would have a better time in Vince McMahon's company this time around. And things started promisingly enough as on January 27th, 2018, he would appear in the front row at TakeOver Philadelphia, announcing his intention to, from there, rise up the ranks of NXT on his way to the main roster. And rise up the ranks he did as he quickly established himself as a key player on the black and yellow brand in the weeks and months that followed, with him taking part in the superb six-man ladder match to crown the inaugural North American champion, and then, after that, starting a high-profile feud with the Velveteen Dream, this ultimately leading to a singles match between the two at August 18th's TakeOver Brooklyn 4, during which the new signing would get the win. Following this, there were initial plans for EC3 to be moved up to the main roster, However, this would end up getting delayed after he suffered a concussion during the latter match, this resulting in him staying in developmental for a little while longer as he eventually returned to action to take on the likes of Lars Sullivan and Adam Cole. Come December of that year, however, he would finally get his chance to return to the top shows when he began making cameo appearances backstage on Raw, this all eventually leading to his formal debut on the February 4th, 2019 episode of The Red Brand, where he would be a guest on Alexa Bliss's talk show, A Moment of Bliss. After that, he would have a short feud with Dean Ambrose, who was at that point on his way out of the company, with this perhaps being the reason why Carter would end up picking up a win over the former WWE champion during their program. So with a major victory under his belt as well as all the skills Vince McMahon would normally look for in a big time superstar, it seemed like EC3 was ready to be shot to the moon in the weeks that followed. Sadly though, that didn't end up happening as he would almost immediately be reduced to being an undercard act on main event, rarely ever making it over to Raw at all and being treated like a jobber on the few occasions that he did. This of course left many fans baffled as to what could have possibly caused the boss to sour on his newest acquisition so quickly before he'd even had a chance to do anything. And it's something which still remains unclear to this day, with the only real explanation that's been suggested being that the increasingly erratic McMahon just decided one day he simply didn't like him. After that then, there was no hope for the potential superstar and, as time went on, he would descend into even further irrelevancy as he became little more than an extra in the 24-7 championship segments, with him there showing visible signs that he had stopped caring and was just in it to collect a paycheck at that point. Still, despite his disappointment with his trajectory, a job was a job, something which became even more important during the global shutdown of 2020, as all outside indie dates quickly dried up. That was why it hit EC3 hard when, in April of that year, he was one of a series of performers released by WWE in a highly controversial move that the company justified at the time as being due to budget cuts, something which many were left suspicious of when they then posted all-time record profits later that year. Regardless of the reasons though, this meant that the Ohio native was now one of the many who were unemployed during a very difficult period for the world. Trying to make the best of this then, he would release a series of YouTube videos in which he developed a newer, darker incarnation of his gimmick, telling fans that he would then be going by the moniker of The Narrative as he was now in control of his own one once more, and could no longer be held down by the WWE machine. And come July 18th, the next page in this narrative would be written when he returned to Impact Wrestling at Slammiversary, from there making his intentions clear as he quickly made a beeline for the, at the time, TNA World Heavyweight Champion Moose. As well as that, he would also find himself making a number of appearances for Ring of Honor, a company he's continued to wrestle with to this day, with him even recently signing a full-time contract with them. 
And as it stands right now, that's where he remains, once more working his way up the ladder and hoping to reach superstardom again. Will this happen? Well, that depends on where he goes. It seems unlikely WWE would ever push him as a top-level guy at this point, despite him having all the talent in the world, but one of the best things about being a wrestler in 2021 is that there are plenty of other options for someone to seek out if they want to make a full-time living. In the end, whatever does happen to him, we're sure he'll succeed, because as his history has shown, when you're in the top 1% like he is, it's almost impossible to fail in the long run. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.